This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream. When you sign up at the link in the description, you will now also get free access to Nebula, a new video streaming platform that I and a bunch of your favorite educational YouTubers have built for ourselves. In January 2018, Xiaomi overtook Samsung to become the number one smartphone brand in India, the second largest smartphone market in the world by volume. After two years of incredible growth, the company shipped almost a quarter of all smartphones in the country and its rise seemed unstoppable. Its relentless focus on aggressive pricing and its rabid online fan base spread the brand so quickly, Xiaomi was not only driving local Indian brands like Micromax and Carbon out of the market, but even one successful international players like Samsung, Oppo and Vivo were starting to feel the pressure. Oppo in particular was having a tough time, sliding back from its 10% market share at its peak to single digits, despite having spent an obscene amount of money on promotion and sponsorships in the country. Simply throwing more money at the problem wasn't working for them. They had to try something new. And in May of 2018, just four months after Xiaomi took the crown of India, that something became Realme, now the fastest growing smartphone brand in the world that not only managed to stop the growth of Xiaomi in India, but also managed to go from zero to becoming the seventh largest smartphone brand worldwide in just a year and a half. As it turns out, Realme was actually built by my former colleagues from back when I still worked at Oppo, and I actually managed to interview some of them for this video. I also managed to get my hands on the X2 Pro, their latest flagship. So in the 60th episode of the Store Behind series, let's take a look at what I've learned about the incredible rise of this new company. Real quick before we start, if you want to see more in-depth analysis of tech companies, especially from a business perspective, consider subscribing to TechAltar. Realme at its launch seemed like a half-hearted experiment that Oppo rushed out of the gate in their desperation to claw back at least some market share from Xiaomi in India. The Realme One was launched with the Oppo logo still on, ran Oppo's very own color OS instead of a custom Realme software skin, and really only had two standout features. First, its flashy back cover, which was simply a recycled design from older Oppo phones, and second, a very strong price performance ratio that tried to match Xiaomi as closely as possible. Oppo was apparently so uncertain about this experiment that they also launched the exact same phone under the Oppo brand in some markets as the Oppo F7 Youth, so in case it didn't sell under the Realme brand, they could still push it out through their usual channels as an Oppo phone. And the Realme One wasn't revolutionary in any way. Even its brand name was clearly designed to imitate Redmi rather than create an entirely new identity of its own. But starting at just under 10,000 rupees or a little over 100 euros, it became a huge success among price conscious Indian consumers nonetheless. The first batch of the phone sold out in two minutes and Realme went on to sell over 400,000 units in its first two months of existence. I've heard that Oppo was actually very much surprised by just how successful their first Realme device was, which suddenly not only proved to them that they could in fact compete against Xiaomi directly, but unexpectedly also gave them a pretty clear blueprint for how to do it. See, as I said, this phone really only had two standout features, a processor that was stronger than competitors in its class and its flashy design when most competitors looked rather bland at this price point. At almost anything else, it was worse than the competition. It was made of plastic instead of metal, it had single instead of dual cameras, and it didn't even have a fingerprint reader. But the processor and the design proved to be the exact right things to focus on. Because those two made the phone both look like it was a category above the competition and then give it a spec sheet that instantly backed up that first impression to its spec-hungry target audience. Sacrificing all the other nice-to-have stuff for those two were the exact right decision. And I'm told that even now, flashy design and specs have continued to be the top priorities that the company puts above everything else. And so with those learnings, Oppo actually started taking this experiment extremely seriously and doubled down on Realme with a ferocity and with an agility that would actually put most startups to shame, let alone companies of this size. They quickly turned Realme into its own legal entity, moved a bunch of key people from Oppo over to this new company, created a whole new branding and design identity for it, built a massive portfolio of 15 fonts that range from entry level to flagships, built up their own web shops as well as strong partnerships with online retailers, entered over 20 markets and recently even established their own online forums, which Xiaomi was so successful with. 
Within just 18 months, they actually replicated almost every strength Xiaomi had and sprinkled their own unique approach of focusing on eye-catching design and performance on top. With devices like the X2 Pro, which is a full flagship with a Snapdragon 855+, Plus, 50 50W Super VOOC fast charging and a 90Hz screen that starts at an insane 399 euros, it's clear that they are in the ring at every price point, ready to compete with anything Xiaomi brings to the market. Now, while all of that is incredibly impressive and kudos to the Realme team for all of their achievements, they of course couldn't have done it all alone. In fact, much like OnePlus, Realme 2 still benefits massively from its relationship with Oppo. While Realme designs and sells their phones on their own now and is slowly becoming more and more independent, Oppo still develops Color OS for them, licenses core technologies like SuperVOOC to them, and most importantly, takes care of the manufacturing and supply chain for Realme and its factories in India, China, and the rest of the world. In fact, my personal guess is that the shared manufacturing of Oppo, OnePlus and Realme is not only the source of Realme's success, as Oppo is known to have world-class manufacturing and quality control capabilities that easily beat those of Xiaomi, who tends to outsource as much as possible to save costs. This sharing of resources, in my opinion, is actually also the reason Realme exists in the first place. And I'm making a couple of guesses here, but Realme on its own really doesn't seem to be that attractive of a business. While they somehow claim that they already are technically profitable, with prices this aggressive, I just can't imagine them doing anything but barely breaking even. And while Xiaomi, who has similarly aggressive hardware prices, is trying to make most of their money from ads and software subscriptions that they're pushing through MIUI, Realme tells me that they don't even see that as important. So making a real profit doesn't seem to be the main goal of the company at this stage. Which leads me to believe that the real goal, at least originally, was to A, simply hurt Xiaomi and deny them the chance to become overly dominant in key markets like India, and to B, create an economies of scale advantage for Oppo and OnePlus. Which worked. With the help of Realme, the three brands together now ship somewhere around 45 million phones a quarter. That is significantly more than even Xiaomi does, meaning that they can get better prices on components and they can have more efficient supply chains, for example, while Xiaomi suffers from their pressure. So in this way, Realme has already succeeded. Now, of course, Realme has almost certainly surpassed all original expectations of Oppo. And as time goes on and as it becomes more successful, they'll probably want to become more and more independent. And just like OnePlus has done in the past, they'll start to want to serve its own interests as a company rather than just the interests of the group as a whole. I was told, for example, that Realme soon wants to develop their own software skin instead of just using Color OS, as well as expand more aggressively beyond just smartphones to adjacent product categories like their recently announced AirPods clones or maybe smartwatches and lifestyle items to take on Xiaomi there as well. And whatever comes next for them, be it their expansion to Europe that they have just started, or their forays to the US, which I'm told are on the table as well, it will be a fascinating journey to follow. I've actually made two more videos that are really closely linked to this topic. So one of them is about how Xiaomi operates with its razor thin hardware margins and its business model explained. And then the other one is why all of these smartphone companies launch so many unique brands. Uh, I think if you like this video, you'll like both of them. You can watch both of them somewhere here. And if you like independent educational creators like me, Real Engineering, Polymatter, Tier Zoo, Wendover Production, and like a hundred others, then I have some really good news. We have recently launched Nebula, our very own video streaming platform that is built and owned by us, the creators. We put all of our regular YouTube videos there, ad-free of course, and I actually upload my videos a couple of days in advance there because I just don't have to deal with a sponsor on that platform. Nebula is also quickly getting some really good original content, so there's this whole feature-length documentary on airports from Wendover, for example, a whole series of the logistics of D-Day from Real Engineering, and more. Nebula makes it possible for us to create more great content for you guys without having to constantly worry about demonetization or somehow pleasing the magical YouTube algorithm, and, and I think you guys will love the result. Now, as I said in the beginning, this video was actually sponsored by CuriosityStream, and that's where this becomes even cooler. Because CuriosityStream, which of course is the service for watching high quality documentaries online, likes our project so much that they have decided to give everyone who signs up to their service using the link in the description of this video free access to Nebula. 
So for a $20 yearly subscription, you get unlimited access to both Nebula and all of CuriosityStream's library of thousands of documentaries on anything from wildlife to technology. They will simply send you an email with sign-up info for Nebula once you get your CuriosityStream subscription and you're good to go. So whether you want to support your favorite creators and watch our videos a few days in advance without ads, or whether you want to watch a documentary on the birth of the solar system, for example, you can now get both for just under $20. Check it out and I'll see you in the next one.